the art of launching. The best brands never start out with the intent of building a great brand. They focus on building a great and profitable product or service and an organization that can sustain it. Scott Bradbury Let's start with the art of launching. Jump curves. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, ice harvesting was a flourishing business in New England. This involved people, horses, and sleighs out on frozen lakes and ponds, cutting blocks of ice. Let's call this ice 1.0. 30 years later, people froze water in ice factories and ice men delivered ice in trucks. These entrepreneurs didn't have to wait for winter or live in a cold city. They could provide ice anytime and anywhere. Call this ice 2.0. Entrepreneurs created a refrigerator 30 years after that. Instead of buying ice from a factory, people had their own ice factory. The first PC, personal shiller, call this ice 3.0. Entrepreneurship is at its best when it alters the future, and it alters the future when it jumps corpse. None of the ice harvesters started ice factories, and none of the ice factories became refrigerator companies. They defined their business in terms of what they were doing. Cutting blocks of ice out of frozen ponds, freezing water centrally, or manufacturing water freezing gadgets, instead of what they meant, convenience and cleanliness. Had they taken this perspective, they might have jump curbs from harvesting to factory to refrigerator. The concept of jumping corpse is an excellent model for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is at its best when it alters the future, and it alters the future when it jumps the corpse. Typewriter, two daisy wheel printer, two laser printer, two a 3D printer. Telegraph to telephone, to mobile phone, to smartphone. Cassette player, to Walkman, to iPod. Let's do an exercise. Does your product offer better sameness or does it jump to the next curb? A tactical framework is helpful to jump curbs. I use the acronym DICE for this purpose. It answers the fundamental question. What are the qualities of curb jumping products? Deep. Curb jumping products provide features and functionality that customers may not appreciate or realize at first. Customers don't run out of power and outgrow curb jumping products. Google is a deep company. It offers search, advertising, operating system, digital store, social media, analytics, apps, computers, tablets, phones, home delivery, online storage, hosting, internet access, maps, self-driving cars. You could use only Google products and have everything you need for computing. Intelligent. A curb jumping product shows people that a company who created it understood their pain or problem. For for example, sells an option called My Key. Parents can program the top speed of the car and loudest volume of the stereo into the key for when their kids or ballets drive it. That's an intelligent product. Complete. Corp jumping products are not isolated gizmos, online downloads or web services. They include pre-sales and after-sales support. 
documentation, enhancements, and complementary products. For example, Kindle Direct Publishing, the collection of services that Amazon provides self-published authors, has almost everything a writer needs. That includes distribution in ebook print on demand, and audio recording formats, production services, and marketing assistance. Empowering. Corp jumping products make people better by increasing their productivity and creativity. You don't fight great products. They become one with you. I have felt this way about Macintosh since 1983. It empowers me to write, speak, and advice. I would not be who I am without Macintosh. Elegant. Elegance is a combination of power and simplicity. Elegance is what is not there, not what it what is. It cuts through the noise, captures our attention, and engages our hearts. Companies that create corp jumping products obsess about design and user interface. There is a high degree of craftsmanship and love that goes into corp jumping products. Exercise. Are you creating a product that is deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant? Let's move on. Pick a good name. A good name for a startup and a product is like pornography. Hard to define, but you know it when you see it. If you want a good example of what not to do, look at the names of Japanese products. For example, if your goal was to confuse your customers, you could not do a better job than naming your cameras the Nikon D4S, DF, D3X, D810, D7000, D5000. Here's how to pick a good name. Check other usage. The websites are your best friends in the naming process. Use advanced search to see if the name is on Twitter, now X, is on Facebook, Google Plus, Pinterest, Instagram, LinkedIn. Pick a name with verb potential. In a perfect world, your name enters a mainstream vernacular and becomes a verb. For example, people Google words instead of searching for them on the net. Names that work as verbs are short, no more than two or three syllables, and simple. I look forward to the day when people can buy a graphic instead of design it. Exercise. See if the names you're considering work in this sentence. Try making your name like a verb, like googling it, combining it, etc. Run it past from other countries. Use online translation sites to check the meaning of your names in other languages. Even better, once you're sure you have the domain, ask your social media followers that the name means in their language. You're more likely to catch slang and negative connotations by using human assets in this manner. Pick a word that begins with a letter early in the alphabet. Someday your organization or product name will appear in an alphabetical list. When this happens, it's better to appear early in the list than later. Imagine, for example, the conference directory for an event with a thousand exhibitors. Where would you like your listing? Avoid words that begin with numbers or X and Z. Numbers are a bad idea for names because people don't 
know whether to use numerals, 1, 2, 3, or spell out the number, 1, 2, and 3, spelling it. X and Z yield names that are difficult to spell, even after hearing them, and they are late in the alphabet. Pick a name that sounds different. A name should not sound like anything else. For example, consider Clarins, Claritin, and Claria. Claro. Which names refer to online marketing versus cosmetics and antihistamines and online shops? Even if you did remember, it's likely that you would associate all three or four words with one category. Avoid multiple word names unless the first word has bare potential or the acronym spells out so something clever. For example, Google Technology Corporation would have been fine. The name Hawaiian Island Ministries, a parachurch organization that trains pastors and ministers, becomes him, a clever homonym with him and play on him, that is, God. Capitalize the first letter. I made a mistake when naming a company I founded called Garage.com. Lowering the G made it difficult to pick out the name in blocks of text. The usual cue that the word was a proper noun wasn't there. You'd think that someone named Guy would know this. Don't worry, be crappy. The first step in launching a company is not to fire up Word, PowerPoint or Excel. There's a time for using this application, but it's not now. Instead, your next step is to build a prototype of your product and get it to customers. I call this Don't Worry Be Crappy, inspired by Bobby McFerrin's song Don't Worry Be Happy. Eric Ries, author of The Lean Startup, calls this the minimum viable product, MVP. Ries explains why the MVP concept in this way. It is not necessarily the smallest product Im imaginable, though it is simply the fastest way to get through the build measure, learn feedback loop, with a minimum amount of effort. The goal of the MVP is to begin the process, not end it. I'll add two words to MVP and transform it to MBBBP. Minimum viable valuable validating product. First, the product can be viable, able to get through the feedback loop and make money. But that's not enough. It should also be valuable that it jumps curves, making meaning and changes the world. Let's aim high. Second, your product should also validate the vision of your startup. Otherwise, you may have a viable and valuable product, which is good, but not necessarily one that validates the big picture of what you're trying to achieve. For example, the first iPod was not only a viable product, early to market and profitable, it was also valuable, a first way to legally and conveniently buy music for a handy device. And validating, people wanted elegant consumer devices, and Apple could transcend selling only computers and peripherals. Note well, this is not permission to ship a piece of crap. Here's a good test. Imagine your product is a new car. Would you let your kids ride in it? If you don't have kids, then your dog? Worry about adoption, not scaling. In the early days of starting up, the ability to scale is overrated. Scale, in case you haven't heard the term, refers to the concept that there are processes 
in place that are fast, cheap and repeatable because there will soon be millions of customers who generate billions of dollars of revenue. For example, if here Omidyar had to test every used printer offer for sale, eBay couldn't scale. If Mark Binioff had to make every sales call, salesforce.com couldn't scale. If Steve Wozniak had to manufacture every Apple, I, Apple couldn't scale. I've never seen a startup die because it couldn't scale fast enough. Holding yourself to a mass scaling test in the early days is a mistake, putting the proverbial horse before the cart. This is akin to wondering if you should start a restaurant because it may be impossible to scale the perfectionism of an executive chef for multiple locations. How about first ensuring that people within in a 20 mile radius like the food before worrying about scaling the restaurant? That is, see if the business will work at all. For example, a company that I advise called Tutor Universe provides tutoring service via smartphones. Think of it as Uber for tutoring. A long-term plan was that students could ask questions about any topic and receive help in under 15 minutes. However, in the beginning, a critical mass of tutors for every subject didn't yet exist. Many startups face just such a chicken or egg challenge. If you had enough tutors, you'd attract enough students. If you had enough students, you'd attract enough tutors. What do you do when you're faced with this kind of challenge? The answer is simple. You cheat. You use your own employees to answer questions and hire tutors in the Philippines, highly educated, English-speaking, and cheap, until you can reach a critical mass of a marketplace. Skeptics and experienced entrepreneurs may object. You can scale if you have to use employees or hire tutors, because they are too expensive. This may be true, but it doesn't matter. What's important is that you establish three key points. You can get the word out. Students are willing to install an app, and they will pay for help. Your priority, in short, is proving that people will use your product at all. If they won't, then it won't matter if you can scale. If they will, then you will figure out a way to scale. I'd never seen a startup die because it couldn't scale fast enough. I've seen hundreds of startups die because people simply refuse to embrace their product. Craft app positioning. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Willy E. Coyote, genius. I am not selling anything, nor I'm working my way through college. So let's get down to cases. You're a rabbit and I'm going to eat you for supper. Now, don't try to get away. I am more muscular, more cunning, faster and larger than you are. And I am a genius. Why you could hardly pass entrance examinations to kindergarten? Most people consider positioning an unnatural act voiced upon them by marketing, blips or highly paid and clueless consultants. In truth, positioning goes far beyond a marketing exercise. Management offsite or retention of consultants when done properly, it manifests the heart and soul of a new organization by explaining why the founders started the organization, why customers should patronize it, why good people should work at it. Willie E. Coyote understands positioning better than most entrepreneurs. He's a coyote and he eats rabbits for lunch. Startups should position themselves with comparable clarity by answering one simple question. 
What do you do? Developing a good answer to this question involves seizing the high ground for your startup and establishing how it differs from the competitors. Then you must communicate this message to the marketplace. Create one message. While it's hard enough to create and communicate one message, many startups make the mistake of trying to establish more than one because they are afraid of being niche and want the entire market. Our computer is for Fortune 500 departments and for consumers to use at home. Volvos are safe and sexy. Toyotas are economical and luxurious. Pick one message and stick with it for at least six months to see what happens. Do you describe your offering in a way that is opposite to that of your competition? Avoid jargonese. If your branding uses excessive jargon, the odds are that most people won't understand. Your branding and your branding won't last long. For example, best mp3 decoder presumes that people understand what mp3 and decoder meant in 2004. What happens when mp3 is no longer the standard coding format? Take the opposite test. Most companies use the same terms to describe their product. It's as if they all believe that their customers have never heard a product described as high quality, robust, easy to use, fast, or safe. To see what I mean, apply the opposite test. Do you describe your offering in a way that is opposite to that of your competition? If you do, then you're saying something different. If you don't, then you your positioning is useless. Cascade a message. Marketing departments typically assume that once they put out the press release or on the ad, the entire world will understand the message. If you craft what you believe is the perfect branding message, first cascade it up and down your startup. Start with your board of directors or founders and work down to Trixie and Beef at the front desk and ensure that every employee understand the branding. Examine the bounce back. You know what messages you send, but you don't know what messages people receive. Here's a concept. Ask them to bounce back the message that you sent so that you can learn how they interpret it. In the end, it's not so much what you say, as much as what people hear. Focus on social media, not adver advertising. Many companies waste millions of dollars trying to establish a brand with advertising. Today, brands are built on what people are saying about them on social media, not on what companies are saying about them. Flow with the go. While you should not let the market position you, it's also true that you cannot ultimately control your positioning. You do the best you can to craft a good message and cascade it to your employees, customers, and partners. But then the market does a strange, powerful, sometimes frustrating, but often wonderful thing. It decides on its own. This can happen because unintended customers are using your product in unintended ways. For example, moms bought Avon's Skin So Soft lotion as insect repellent for their kids, and Avon now sells it for that purpose too. When this happens to you, don't freak out and listen to what the market is telling you. Perhaps it has done you a favor and found a natural positioning for you. Is it one you can live with? In the end, it's better to flow with what's going rather than to prop up something that's not credible. Exercise Step 1. 
write a one paragraph description of your customer's experience when he or she is using your product. Step two, call up a customer and have her write a one paragraph description of using your product. Step three, compare the two district descriptions. Cross the chasm. In crossing the chasm, Geoffrey Muir explores and explains a new product adoption life cycle that includes five different kinds of psychographic profiles innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. Innovators. These risk lovers seek out new products to try, so they are the people who have the latest and greatest before anyone else. Early adopters. They are in the total geeks that innovators are, but they are confident they can put new pure products to good use. Early majority. Members of the early majority adopt a product when they see innovators and early adopters successfully use it. Late majority. Late majority customers are unsure they can handle new products. Thus, they wait until the product is well accepted by many people. Laggards. These people resist new products and often buy them when they have no choice for their product or the product is no longer new. Implication of these profiles is to direct your marketing efforts at innovators, then move on to early adopters, then early majority, and then late adopters crossing the chasm. Eventually, you'll sell to the laggards to each profile provides the reference base to succeed in the next profile. For example, innovators help persuade early adopters to take the leap. There is no other way to put this. Crossing the chasm requires sucking up because innovators and early adopters are often bloggers, journalists and other experts or influencers. They expect you to curry favors. This is how to suck up. Be realistic. It's much easier to help entrepreneurs if they have a great product. People want to be affiliated with products that are innovative, hip and cool. The amount of sucking up you have to do is inversely related to product quality. Show empathy. Who can resist a play on emotion? Please help us. We're just a little starting up, trying to make a go of it. Actually, I'll tell you who can resist this. Potheads who aren't worth sucking up to. The empathy approach usually works on me. Emphasize utility. The best suck ups are mutually beneficial. You are not only getting something, you are also giving something. Or, if you're not in a position to give something right away, you promise to do so in the future. Paid forward. According to social psychology expert Robert Cialini, if someone does something for you, you're obligated to do something in return. Therefore, one strategy is to do things indiscriminately. For people, a rack of points on the karmic scoreboard for later. Go easy on the flattery. You may think that this is the most important element in a sock up, but most of the people you're sucking up to are frequently flattered, deservedly or not. Therefore, flattery isn't always effective. One sentence at the beginning of an email is enough. I learned a lot by reading The Art of the Start. Then focus on good reasons why the people should help you. Plant many seeds. Just when you thought it was safe, there's an alternate approach to crossing the chasm. This one reflects the work of Emmanuel Rosen and Itamar Simonson, which they explain in their book Absolute Value. 
but really influence customers in the age of nearly perfect information. Their idea is that the gradual adoption, trickle-down approach that started when Moses went to see God is less applicable today because online information is getting fast, free and perfect. For example, people can use websites like Amazon to read reviews hours after a product introduction. Innovators, early adopters and early majority users can express their opinions a few minutes after it ships and with leaks even before it ships. Information no longer trickles down, it disperses fast, free and far. For example, in books, who waits to read a New York Times review before buying a book from Amazon? The fast, free and perfect nature of information can turn marketing upside down. Influentials matter less. Many people can evaluate a product and spread their opinions immediately. Influentials still matter for reporting that something shipped, but not necessarily for inspiring purchase or trial. Brands are less important. When information was incomplete and slow, people depended on a brand's imprimatur for quality assurance. In the book Business, the average number of stars on Amazon and the first few comments that strangers have posted are more important and visible on Amazon than that of the publisher's name. Merit is the new marketing. Past experience and loyalty are transient. In a perfect world, the manufacturers of what you bought in the past produce great stuff in the future. In the real world, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. For example, people may love the sharing features of Facebook but never use its email service. I love my Macs, but I use an Android phone. I don't use an iPhone just because it's a Apple. Altogether, this means that merit is the new marketing. Here's how to thrive in this world. Embrace the nobodies. Lonely Boy 15 and LA Trixie are as likely to make your product a success as influential bloggers and traditional journalists. Anyone who gets your cause and wants to help is a friend to have. Nobodies are the new somebodies. Abandon the illusion of control. Omniscience and omnipotence are illusions. You can know who can and will help you. Nor can you control people with your marketing and advertising. So blast your product out and then flow with the go. Plant many seeds. Plant fields of flowers, not flower boxes. This is a strategy of big numbers. The more seeds, the more flowers. You never know which seed will turn into a sunflower. Which method should you use? Cross the chasm or, per of, or perfect information? The answer is both. Some people do reach through influential top of the pyramid methods and others you reach by blasting. As with other entrepreneurial topics, there isn't a right and wrong. There's only what works and what doesn't. And you can only find out what works by experimentation. Tell a story. I have watched thousands of products introductions by famous CEOs as well as by two guys, gals in a garage, and most of them follow the same dull script. Thank you for coming. We develop an innovative, patent pending, corp jumping, revolutionary, strategic new product after listening carefully to our customers. This new product can slice and dice at a much lower price. Here's a list of bug features described with incomprehensible acronyms. That is blah blah blah. Now let me introduce Beef Smith, the product manager who will demonstrate it 
since I don't know how to use it. We'll release the product sometime in the future, at a price we haven't determined. We are announcing it today because we heard our competition is about to release a similar product. This type of introduction, even a serious version of it, doesn't work, because it focuses on information and fails even to deliver that. People want more than information. They are up to their eyeballs in information. They want faith, faith in you, in your product, your success, and in the story you tell. Faith, not facts, moves mountains. Meaningful stories inspire faith in you and your product. Genuine influence goes deep and getting people to do what you want them to do. It means people pick up where you stop and go further because they have faith. Here are four storylines from Lewis Kelly, author of Beyond Boss, The Next Generation of Word of Mouth Marketing, to help you inspire faith. Personal stories. Epic is not necessary, illustrative is enough. For example, my father owned a Cadillac and he drove it 150,000 miles without major problems versus this car will last you a long time or I gave my teenage son an Android phone and he told me he liked it better than his iPhone versus Android phones are good or my girlfriend wanted to sell her pest dispensers online versus I wanted to create a perfect market. This is the story that Pierre Omidyar uses to explain the genesis of eBay. Great aspirations. A hero wants to make the world a better place and knows that there must be a better way. Working nights and weekends and always believing in what he's doing, he creates a better gizmo that people love. To his surprise and delight, lots of people like that, like what he creates. Example, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak wanted to make it possible for everyone to use computers. David versus Goliath. Goliath had a head start, incredible resources, and a cast of thousands. There is no way that the David can succeed against Behemoth Goliath, but young David whips out his technological breakthrough, a slingshot, and succeeds despite the wisdom of the masses that there is no way he could. Examples Southwest Airlines taking on the big airlines, Etsy taking on eBay, and Pinterest taking on Facebook. Profiles in Courage Our hero suffers under major injustice. Despite these woes, he perseveres and accomplishes great things. When you learn what he has done, your reaction is, there is no way that I could have done that. Example, Charlie Wedemeyer, the high school football coach with ALS, and Oscar and Emily Schindler, the couple who protected you during World War II. A great launch is more than a press release that the dump, one-sided assertions and boring sales pitches. It tells a story of innovation, change and empowerment that catalyzes faith in what you're doing. Provide a safe, easy first step. You're probably making a big ask because innovation requires a change in behavior and defiance of the status quo. Those the path of adopting your products must have a slippery slope because of the size of the hill. This compels you to remove any speed bumps that you can. Here are the desired characteristics of a first step. Easy to start. Companies often establish procedures that make it hard to do business. It's almost as if they are purposely trying to frustrate potential customers. The best example is CAPTCHA screens. 
forms that people have to fill out in order to get an account on many websites. They are too difficult to read. Upper versus lower case. I versus one and zero versus zero. I swear that this technology is called capture because it captures folks in an endless loop of trying to prove to a machine that you are human. Easy to convert. Ideally, the slope to adopt your product is slippery and gradual so that the transition is easy. In tech businesses, this means accepting your competition's data format as well as industry standards. In non-tech business, this means that your product uses the same plugs, packages, coupons, and practices so that people have to change their behavior as little as possible. Easy to use. Once you have people started and converted, the next step is to ensure that they can use and even master your product. This requires design sensibility, empathy for preventing frustration, and ability to put yourself in the shoes of your customers. It means delivering an elegant, transparent user interface, clear and accurate documentation, and outstanding customer support. If you have a great product, getting in the door may be the hardest part of the battle. Easy to share. It's hard to make a product that's so compelling that people want to share it. If you do, it's a shame if there's not an easy way for people to share the good news about it. The next time you're visiting a website, look for buttons that say share this or email to a friend and implement similar function. Add this and share this are two services that you can use for this. A positive example of providing a safe, easy first step is how a solar panel called Songevity provides estimates. Whereas the first step for working with most home improvement companies is setting up an appointment. Songevity asks for your address and they use as a satellite photo to make an estimate of the size, power and cost of solar panels for your house. Get out of the office. Buddha got out of the palaces where he would have lived if the decision had been up to his father. He saw how people living in the real world influenced his religious concepts. If getting out was good for Buddha, it's good for you too. For example, Pitch Not made a dramatic statement when it created a 100% natural line of baby food that contain no additives. This project started when Beach Nut employees visited 10 homes to watch how moms made food for their babies. They learned that moms wanted total control of what went into the food and didn't trust manufacturers. Because of this research, when you see a jar of Beach Nut baby food that says, just pineapple, beer and avocado, it means there is nothing in that jar but apples and strawberries. The bitch not folks also saw that every mom fed her babies avocados because these fruits are healthy, form of fat and are easily digestible. At the time, no commercially made baby food contained avocados. Because the bitch not people got out of the office, they added two avocado products to their line. Simply shipping an MBBBP product isn't enough. Sure, you'll learn about its strengths and weaknesses from actual customers. But don't limit yourself to online comments and cumulative reports. Go and see for yourself how people are using them. Conduct a premortem. Doctors conduct postmortems to figure out why people died. They do this to solve a crime, prevent the death of others, and satisfy curiosity. However, once somebody dies, it's too late to help me, him. Entrepreneurs and their investors also often analyze why a product, service, or company died, especially if it's someone else's company. And 
as in the case of dead people, a post-mortem is too late to do much good for a defunct product, service or company. Enter the concept of premortems, coined by Gary Klein, chief scientist of Klein Associates and author of Sources of Power, How People Make Decisions. His idea is to get your team together and pretend that your product has failed. That's right, failed, cratered, imploded, or went aloha. As we say, you ask the team to come up with all the reasons why the failure occurred. Then each member has to state one reason until every reason is on a list. The next step is to figure out ways to prevent every reason from occurring. You can ask the team to report the issues and challenges, because regular meetings are governed by mind games and unwritten rules. For example, not embarrassing your friends, not looking like a poor team player by criticizing others, and not making enemies. You can tell me that everyone is completely open and honest in these gatherings. By contrast, people are not laying blame on one another and other groups in a premortem, a properly conducted one anyway, everyone is compiling a list of the hypothetical factors that may come into play, and all means all, because it would be a shame if someone had thought of an issue, but then dismiss it as not important enough to mention. Exercise. Write a list of a 10 factors that could kill your lunch. How many can you eliminate? And that said, my fellow students, it's all for today's lesson into the art of launching. After hearing this, please go to your weekly activity. Thank you for listening and see you pretty soon. And always be innovative. Jump your curves. Remember, don't worry. Be crappy. Worry about adoption, not scaling. That's it. Goodbye.